It's time to talk the world's game from an American perspective. Presented by Three Lions Pub, you're listening to Two Up Front, where we focus on all things American soccer. From the NWSL, MLS, U.S. national teams, and all the way to the youth levels. Now in the studio, your hosts, Baxter Colburn and Simon Provan. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the next edition of Two Up Front, presented by Three Lions Pub. I am Baxter Colburn. No Simon Provan this week. He is off traveling the great United States with his wonderful family for the summer. Uh, he'll be back at some point, but uh, uh, if I understand correctly, he's off doing the, the Laura Ingalls Wilder Trail or something of that nature. So uh, he is off doing that with his family this week. Uh, he sends his regards. Uh, he sends that he loves all of you and misses all of you deeply. Uh, so that was you that were looking for stat-filled, analytical-filled, old man soccer things. This is not the show for you this week. Uh, there's no Simon this week. But uh, we'll do our best to, to keep it up for you. Uh, I've got a good, uh, great, wonderful, amazing co-host with me this week. I'll get to who that is in just a minute. Uh, we're also going to be joined a little bit later in the program by Fox Sports International's Mark Sherbert to help us recap the USA-Mexico 1-1 draw last night at the Azteca, or Sunday night rather. Uh, it's, it was a lot of fun. It was exciting time, but we'll talk to Mark uh, in just a little bit about that. A quick reminder for you, though, those that are continuing to listen in, remember you can find us on Spreaker.com. We're on iTunes and on iHeartRadio as well, too. So no matter what device you like to listen to do up front, we are grateful for your listenership. You can find on numerous different platforms, so make sure to go do that. And then, of course, those social media savants out there, Twitter, you can find us, the number two, at 2UpfrontSoccer. I am at Baxter Colburn, at Simon Provan. If you want to tweet at us, that regards as well, too. We are on Facebook as well, too. If you want to give us a little like over there, give us a share, give us a comment, give us a heart, a ha-ha, whatever exactly you want to do on our things that we post on the Facebook. So a lot of different things, a lot of different ways. We have an Instagram, too. We don't really use it very much. We probably should, uh, since that's what the kids are doing nowadays. So maybe I'll bring that out, or maybe finally hire an intern or something, and we'll just assign them to go Instagram, everything soccer-related. So... Uh, with all that being said, I, I mentioned this at the top of the program. Uh, we have a fill-in co-host for Simon this week. She has been on the program several times before as a guest, as a correspondent. Uh, she, uh, for many of you know, uh, has played the women's game professionally at the highest level. Uh, and now she uh, resorts to spinning and eating smoothies out of a cup. It's Rachel Wood. She's here on the program this morning. A very good morning to you, Rachel. How are you today? Good morning. Um, two Up Friends' best friend is back, and I couldn't be more excited to be here. Yes, So best thank friend. you for having me this week. Well, so exciting. When I when I talked to Simon, I'm like, well, who are we going to get to co-host? He's like, well, whatever. I'm like, absolutely. The Two Up Friends' best friend. We need to get you like a shirt or something, Rachel. I would love a shirt, and I would rock, and I would post it on Instagram. That's true. You should. Maybe maybe you should take over the two up front Instagram. That might be better for all involved. I could do that. There you yeah. Go. You want to be the two up front? You, often, you see how often I have my Instagram, so you yeah. you know I'm good. It's like once every three weeks. Right. And that's yeah. that's beating I could totally out. run I could totally run the Instagram. Right. And you're <laughs> you're you're beating out what we do on Instagram by maybe a week or two. So I think I post a random picture smile of my son in some sort of soccer apparel just to get a couple of pity likes basically or pity hearts. I've sent him soccer apparel, and I yet have seen. I haven't seen a picture yet, so maybe you can. Um, uh, that's one way to get me to be the intern. I don't know if you check your Snapchat smile or not, Rachel, but there was a moment a couple weeks ago. He was wearing the uh, New England Revolution bib that you sent him, uh, and we sent you a Snapchat. We and he was like, "Oh, wearing the bib." Anti Rachel sent. Never got a response. Never got a. Never got a an anything from you. So before you saying that, we put him in things that you sent him, which was very nice of you. Uh, maybe you should check yourself uh, first. <laughs> I wonder what version of my iPhone six that was. Probably three or four ago. Because I've had about four of them in the past month. If you to donate to Rachel's iPhone fund, she continues to recycle them as quickly as the Houston never going head coach. So, uh, good luck with that. Ooh, zinger. Uh, boom. Zinger. Had to, that, had to get off my chest right off the bat. So, uh, <laughs> but we'll we'll get into that in the NWS and so much more in a little bit. Uh, we we start every show, Rachel, with the segment that we call the kick around. Uh, where we talk about some of the more notable things in the soccer world, uh, sometimes internally, sometimes domestically. Uh, we do focus a lot on the NWSL and MLS uh, on this program, so we try to save those specific stories for a little bit later on. Uh, so one of the first things I want to do right off the bat, uh, this was close to home for a lot of people. Uh, for the United States, obviously, they were trying to vie for a U-20 World Cup uh, just a couple of weeks ago. They actually ended up losing uh, a little bit earlier than they thought they would to uh, eventual runner-up Venezuela. But they got what came to them. England 
uh, ended up winning the U20 World Cup to a 1-0 victory, a 35th minute goal by Dominic Calvert-Lewin, uh, apparently. Uh, Italy finished third uh, after they ended up beating Uruguay in a penalty kick shootout. So uh, England, their U20 World Cup champions over Venezuela, and then Italy, Viva Italia, finishes third. Uh, U20s, uh, I, I've been making this point for uh, Rachel, I don't know how closely you follow the tournament or not, but if you want to get a good gauge on how your team is going to be at the senior level, uh, maybe by next World Cup, if not for sure by the 2022 World Cup, you should watch the U20 World Cup. Absolutely. No, I couldn't agree more, especially um, I think it's a good sign for England because I think England is one of those that typically tends to underperform uh, yes. at the senior level. So I think that this is a really good sign for England. I would agree with you on that one, too. I mean, England, the last several World Cups, I mean, I feel like they're always one of the most hyped teams coming in, like, oh, we've got Wayne Rooney, oh, we've got, like, this This England team hasn't been good since David Beckham's 12th hairstyle. I mean, like, it's been a long time since David, <laughs> since David Beckham, you know, and, and company were trouncing around the globe. Guys like Steven Gerrard and Frank Lampard were, were playing at the top of their game. It's been... It's been a long time, and if England can have a sliver of hope, maybe they're just... I could see somebody in a pub somewhere being, we won the World Cup! Frank, it was the U-20s. Ah, we won the the World Cup! (laughs) Yeah, you you beat Venezuela. Like, Venezuela doesn't usually make the senior World Cup, so, I mean, you know, I guess guess that's something for you. Long live the queen, you know? Yeah, right. Long live the queen. England England is rising again. (laughs) It is. The, The soccer powerhouse that is England is rising again. Uh, yeah, I, I doubt that. But you, you never know. I mean, the future looks bright for England, so hopefully they can put something together. But we didn't come here to dissect the England senior national team, of course. So uh, they do enough of that and more self-destruction. The fact that Northern Ireland is doing better than England in qualifying seems like, sad to me. But what does that mean? Ouch. Anyway, uh, also, of course, uh, as we mentioned, uh, there was some international friendlies. Uh, we'll talk about the U.S. men's and women's friendlies in a little bit. But Canada, oh, Canada, they were hanging out this last weekend as well, too. They got two big performances out of the gals that you would think, of course. Janine Becky banged in a hat trick as Canada beat Costa Rica 6-0. Uh, and then Christine Sinclair and company also scored a couple of more to make it a 3-1 victory as well, too. So 9-1 to total over the games as Canada continues to prove that they are a great team and or they prove that CONCACAF has awful women's teams. Uh, that's probably more an accurate statement. If it's if it's not at the U.S., everybody else after that is pretty much atrocious after that. But did you get a chance to catch any of these uh, Canadian bombarding games at Costa Rica, Rachel? I did not. I was able to follow them on Twitter but was not able to, um, to watch. I was too busy watching um, the U.S. play this week. Ah, there you go. Yeah, and the U.S. of course, as we mentioned, uh, got some victories as well too, which we'll we'll talk about in a little bit. But I think that this should be a good sign for Houston Dash fans. The fact that Ian Becky scored a hat trick. I mean, there's been a lot of uh, darkness down in Houston, and maybe this might be a possible bright light moving forward, especially with Carly Lloyd coming back to the squad here uh, in the next couple of weeks as well. But is it is it safe to say that Kiss still is a five women's team aside from like, the Germanys and the U.S.s and even the Sweden some argue and even England as well? Yeah, absolutely. So I think between their head coach, um, John Ehrman, I think he's just done a fantastic job there. And if you go through the lineup and you look at the players, you know, so many of them are playing in the NWSL and in the top leagues in the world. Um, you know, you've got Christine Sinclair, who's – she was actually, during my pro debut, um, the woman that I had to man mark. Oh, perfect. <laughs> in the world and she brings so much experience to that team and I think so much leadership and I think that um, you know they continue to to improve players are playing in this league um, I feel like I've seen a really dramatic increase um, in their play and I think you know a nation you reckoned with and to you know the, they're on everyone's radar now yeah, and I would agree with you on that one as well, too. I mean, Canada has been this team that I feel like has progressively just gotten better the last, I would say, decade. I mean, that was that was always the big thing because on the men's side for the U.S., it's always USA-Mexico, but on the women's side, it's USA-Canada. Uh, and there's been some instant classics that we've seen the last even yep. five or six years, and uh, I, I can remember a lot of those games very vividly. I mean, with either going one way or the other, I guess, for, for both sides, and Canada's a very talented team. I'm a little little sad for them that they didn't do better this last Women's World Cup, especially since they were the host nation. Uh, but sometimes that happens. The big stage can sometimes not always um, be be what you think it's going to be, especially when you're at that uh, that high level. So 
Uh, Canada's an exceptional team. I think they've got an incredible youth system as well, too. Uh, this is going to be a team that's going to be reckoned with. And I, I think, honestly, could win either the next World Cup or at least that next one after that because they have the talent to do something really special, I feel like. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, again, it's you see these talented players and, you know, on paper they look they look great. And these guys are really sort of paving the way for – for the youth players to come up through, through those programs. And, you know, it, it's a process. You can't just expect to have one great team and, and all of a sudden, you know, you're winning everything. It's, you know, it's a process and you need to build um, that experience and, and that chemistry. And so I think we're going to see Canada getting progressively better and better and better um, over the next couple of years. And I think, you know, they're, Canada has been put on the map, and I think I think they're sort of here to stay. So I'm excited to see kind of what comes out of Canada in the next, you know. Yeah, I would agree with you on that one for sure, Rachel. So uh, last thing before we go, apparently, uh, is a new segment that we're debuting, at least just for this show and this show only, is called Rachel's Book Club. Apparently, uh, you're you're reading uh, you're reading a book, but. Before people start wondering why we're going to talk about Pride and Prejudice or the 25th Twilight book or whatever else J.K. <laughs> Rowling is working on to make lots of money, uh, it actually has something to do with the soccer world. It actually is fairly relevant to this conversation. So, Rachel, what are you reading right now? It is soccer-related, and I am reading Julie Foudy's new book, Choose to Matter. Oh. And I actually, yeah, I had the privilege of um, of meeting her on Wednesday at a Positive Coaching Alliance event down in Yale. Um, and the event was called girls in the game and it, you know, there was a great panel, um, of a bunch of coaches and, um, you know, Under Armour and Under Armour executives on the panel and it was just really about women inspiring women and, um, the book in the way that it's been marketed, um, makes it sound like it's only for sort of, you know, teenage girls and for young girls trying to, to find their confidence and, and learn how to lead and, the more I read this book, the more I think that everyone, everyone who is either into sports or leadership or could use, you know, a boost in their confidence should read this book. And actually the, um, the athletic director at Yale, Tom Beckett said that he is going to give this book to his football coach. Um, wow. so, you know, it's, it, it's not just a, you know, it's not just a book for teenage girls. And I have already gotten so much out of this book. And I think I'm, you know, maybe a third of the way through it. So I highly recommend the book to anyone and everyone, especially for, you know, for people my age who, who know the 99ers and who have sort of seen that path paved for them. I mean, the book is just incredible. And so it's, it's, it's a really fun and easy read. And um, I think you'll get a lot out of it. So read it and join the book club. Um, and we can, <laughs> you know, you can sign um, up now, come sign up to be in the yeah, two up front's club. best friend is now um, the leader of a book club. <laughs> and, and I, this is how I make myself invaluable to the show, right? I create new things. She does. And then you have to invite me back right. so that we can talk about it. I, I Otherwise, that, everyone's going to be wondering what happened to the book club. Right, exactly. We don't want to We don't want to have people fired up and coming after us on Twitter because that's, that's the worst thing that could possibly happen. So I, I totally the agree worst, with that. There's nothing worse than an angry book club member. No, that uh, that can you be real. That. that can be bad. My wife is in a book club right now, and I, I I can see the the frustration of different people when you know people when when Becky doesn't read her chapter or something like that. Like absolutely, people, it ruins the whole discussion. People get slapped, and then she tries to go and spark note it. It's totally yeah. different. You don't get the full expi- you know, it, full experience. It's a team sport, Baxter. It is. You gotta pull your weight. <laughs> Book club, the team sport that really matters. All right, we are going to go to a quick break. Uh, when we come back, we're going to look at the NWSL and the women's national team games a little bit closer. Uh, we'll be back with more. Rachel Wood alongside myself. Extra cool. It's two up presented by Three Lines Pub. We'll be back with more right after this.
Welcome back to Two Up Front, presented by Three Lions Pub. I am Baxter Colburn. No Simon Provan this week. He's got the week off. He'll be back hopefully next week, schedule permitting. He's off touring the great outdoors with his family. I, I seem to have a reoccurring theme when it comes to my co-hosts for different shows that I do. They always go and travel the world over the summer, and I'm always the one left back in the studio. I don't know if that means I need to get out more or if I need to find more stable co-hosts. I have no idea what that means. But... Uh, we certainly wish that Simon and his family have a wonderful time out touring the great outdoors for whatever they've got exactly going on. Uh, so if you do want to, if you want to heckle Simon about anything, of course, so you can find him on Twitter at Simon Provan. You can find me at Baxter Colburn. Find Joe on Twitter as well at the number two Two Upfront Soccer. Uh, you can also visit our website TwoUpfrontSoccer dot com as well too. Uh, my co-host Rachel Wood is hanging out with us today. She is uh, the the co-hosting fill in of the day. I don't know. We don't have a sponsor for our, our when, a, when a person subs in. But um, I'm sure it can be by Timex or whoever that would put it in for our Julie Foudy's book. Maybe we can have that. Julie Foudy's official sponsor of Rachel Wood today. So uh, thanks to there Julie for that. So Julie might not I'll know that. Send this to her. Yes, so Julie, if you're listening, we I'm, appreciate I'm, your. <laughs> yes, Julie, we appreciate your contributions to Two Up Front and your official sponsorship of Rachel Wood on the program today. So we will uh, we'll send you an invoice for soccer. Yes. Everything she does. What a gem. Right. Love Julie Foudy. Hashtag best friend. Uh, all right. So best friend. <laughs> there were there were no NWSL games this last weekend, which if you anybody that follows anybody on on Twitter that has to do with the NWSL, people were sad. They were crying. They were memeing. They were gifting ads all over the place. Uh, but there was women's nap games, though. So that helped rejuvenate the spirits of many of folk. Uh, and the U.S. came away with two victories. Two 1-0 victories. Roosevelt powered the U.S. over Sweden 1-0. And then Kristen Press, another 1-0 goal from her, uh, beat Norway uh, the weekend. So uh, let's be, um, I was really bored. I was really bored by these games. <laughs> um, a man, I was very disappointed, in all honesty, from these results, uh, especially the USA-Sweden game. I expected a lot better, and the product just wasn't there for either side, in my personal opinion. I agree with you on that one. I think... Um... I was I was underwhelmed, um, and especially the the Sweden USA game. I I expected to see a lot more emotion and uh, grit given given the given what happened in the last segment, um, and it, it wasn't there. You understand, you know, they haven't been training together. They have, you know, they aren't preparing for uh, a big world tournament. So I understand that in one sense, but at the same time. It runs deep, and I we're all competitors, right? So everyone wants to prove who's best each time they step out on the field. And I just at least from uh, in the game against Sweden. Yeah, I'm going to be honest in this one though. Uh, when I when I saw the final result, and even seeing Rose Lavelle's reaction, and the United States as a whole when that final whistle blew, like yeah, people were like yeah, we won, but it wasn't the reaction of a team that was so upset, you know, and get revenge. I I, I sense almost zero revenge from this game. And you had such high hopes, you know, to to win a gold medal at the Olympics, and then you get, you know, beat in penalty kicks, controversy or not, hope solos, foul choice of language or not. Like you, you, you'd like to think you get this first crack at their place. This isn't even like in the United States. Maybe it would have been different if it was in the United States, but if you could go to a team that knocked you out of a grand competition in their home arena. You'd like to think you're going to really right. try to make a point. Like this, this should have been a six-zero U.S. But Canada did to Costa Rica sort of thing. Like that would have sent a, right. a one-zero game by Rose Lavelle is, is great and it's good for the future of the season. But I don't think it. I feel like if you're Sweden, you're like, all right, not. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't lose a lot of sleep over this loss if I'm Sweden. Right, because the, a one-zero game at soccer that can go either way. We've been, we've all been on on the winning side of a 1-0 game and, and the losing side. And I think the U.S. really wanted to come out and send in like, that final was called. The body language, um, the handshakes, the exchanges at the end of the game, it didn't seem like a team who really came out to to send a message. I think even though we won, no one was really happy with the performance. Yeah, and I think that, that kind of stimulates from, like you mentioned, just the performance as a whole just wasn't there uh, and – it, it said it was very underwhelming. There was a lot of moments throughout both of these games that the U.S. under is better than 95% of the women's teams, I'd like to think. I mean, I think in Canada, Germany, England, France, they could all stick their head in the conversation, of course. But in part, the United States is better than basically almost every opponent they're ever going to face with basically any lineup that they put out there just because of how strong and how deep 
you know, the NWSL and just in general, the United States women's soccer pool is one zero right. result against a sweet team. Like you said, there's pick a pick a storyline. There's a hundred storylines. You've got, you know, former women's coach. You've got they knocked out of the Olympics. Like this is a chance for some of the young rising stars. Like you can go wherever you want to with other storylines. And then I felt like the whistle ended and it was like, well, so when are we going to actually play the game? You know, like I was I was a little, little sad and a little confused by that, in all honesty. Yeah, no, I I couldn't I couldn't agree more with you. And I just think that there was there was a disconnect. And I don't know if it was these two friendlies being played sort of mid season, so players are, you know, in with their clubs and it's not they don't have that sort of cohesion that they would like with the national team. I don't know if the time dips and the travel, there are a lot of factors that go in that I can understand. But at the same time, your country's jersey, you're representing your national team. You have to figure out a way to bring it. Exactly. And it, it you know, it, as if it was, you know, bring it. Oh, it's already been brought. In. It wasn't brought. And I do it's not a word. <laughs> but as the saying goes, it was not brought in, in that game. <laughs> There was a severe lack of broughtenness in that girl. game. Yeah. This is the white girl from California. Exactly. Right. Yes. Like, it was not enough brought in, in, in this game. And, yes. No, I, I agree. I completely agree. It was very over- underwhelming. So you thought maybe the United States would maybe take that sense of broughtenness and bring that to Norway. Uh, and I were speaking about this before we went on there. And you made the point, at least, and I'll let you make it again, that Norway almost looked like the better team. Yeah, I I was very impressed with Norway, especially in the first half. In the second half, the second half felt like a wash to me. It's sort of back in that first half, I thought Norway was the more physical team, the more composed team, the more technically savvy team. They looked patient in the up. They were getting in behind. They were exposing the United States. We sent our fullbacks forward. They just looked like the more sophisticated team. You know, Alyssa Nair had to make a lot of great saves, you know, one off a corner and a couple of other sort of miscommunications uh, with the back line that fell favorably for Alyssa Nair. But I was just really impressed with Norway. And I think, I think with the, with the development that's going on in the rest of the world in the women's game, I think the USA is going to be is going to be caught in a sense. Um, you know, people are figuring out how to increase their athleticism, and with with sort of the technical and tactical understanding that a lot of these countries have, and they've sort of brought up through their youth system. I think it's really it's really apparent to see, and I think we saw that in the Norway game for sure. Yeah, and I would agree with you. That was wasn't that that was the biggest thing for the United States is like, well, they they have the most fit team on the field, no matter no matter what. But as you mentioned, we're seeing this shift. We're seeing the Canadas, we're seeing the Englands, the Frances, the the Norways figuring out. I mean, hey, if we focus more on nutrition and fitness, we might actually be able to keep up with some of these good teams. Like some people, like you and I, might be like, well, well yeah, obviously that makes sense, but for some reason that doesn't always translate over to a program and their philosophies at times as well too so uh the fact that norway was able to give the united states such a a headache uh i think is a is a testament that as you mentioned it's better for women's soccer as a whole because women's soccer is now continuing to grow because nobody wants to watch a league that has three good teams or four good teams you know, like right. nobody, nobody wants to see Golden State and Cleveland go at it every single year. Nobody wants to see the USA and Germany or you or whoever. You know, the, those four or five teams of the women's game go at it every single World Cup. We want to see the outsiders. We want to see the Norways. We want to see the Swedens. We want to see the Mexicos, the Venezuelas. Like you don't, you don't necessarily know. I mean, Costa Rica, if they decide to put it together. Like I think that's why when Japan came out of nowhere, and at least from what it seemed, and won the World Cup and was such a dominant force for so long, people were kind of taken aback by that for a little bit because it was not the usual conversation teams. It wasn't the U.S., it wasn't Canada, it wasn't England, it wasn't Germany, you know? Right. And I think we have to get back to talking about process, sort of like I mentioned with Canada earlier, right? It's, it's a process and things are changing. And in a process, things tend to change more slowly. So, you know, I I can't discredit the the United States because look, they went over there and they got two results. And I think that's what makes still one of, if not the greatest team in the world still is that they find a way to win, even when they're, they aren't at their best, even when the soccer isn't at, at its best. 
Um, and that's what's made the program so successful. It's, you know, it's the American sort of mentality and physicality and athleticism. Um, but I think what we're starting to see now is that even though we're getting that we're, we're still getting these results, we aren't dominating like we used to. And I think that that was so apparent. Yes. Yes. Pull out the victory and, and, but there are a lot of shaky moments, and, you know, again, it's not going to go either way, right, for Norway or, you know, the, the cross that um, the Norwegian put in in the second half hits the underside of the crossbar and goes in instead of the top side of the crossbar, you know, so there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of chance in a soccer game, and, and again, you know, Chris and Press took, took that ball and, um, you know, was able to put it in the back of the net, but it wasn't a dominant performance like we're used to seeing from the United States. You're right, exactly. Long are the, long gone are the days of the United States putting four to six goals in on a team consistently, and I think some of that just speaks with the with the players and the, sometimes the lack of inexperience and or just the the changing of the tides. I mean, Carly Lloyd, I don't feel like is dominating games anymore like she used to. I mean, maybe that's just because of how certain players are skipped around her, but I feel like the U.S. is so focused on two different things. They're focused on who the next goalkeeper is. Is it going to be Alyssa Nair? Is it going to be Ashlyn Harris when Ashlyn Harris is healthy? Uh, are, are they going to bring in a, you know, an Abby Smith, a Jane Campbell, others as well too that are in the system? And then trying to figure out who's going to be that, that combination dynamic trio or quattro, I guess, up top for the attacking. I mean, Kristen Press, sure, she's a great forward. You've got Sydney LaRue Dwyer. You've got Rose Lavelle. You've got Crystal Dunn. It's great to have so much depth, Mal Pugh and many others, of course, that you can continue to throw into this conversation. But at some point, you need to figure out the best players that are actually going to be able to play together on the field instead of just trying to stock your team full of all these great, talented players. If they can't play together, you're not doing yourself any good at all. Right. And I think that was one of the biggest criticisms um, from these past two games is there wasn't a lot of subbing going on. It was an international friendly. You're allowed six subs and Ellis didn't use all of those subs. Um, and, you know, I'm curious as to sort of what your take is on that, because typically with international friendlies, right, you're trying to see how these players fit together and you're trying to get them experience, but you also need to see sort of the team that you have. And, and there were, you know, there were a few players that, that went on this trip that didn't even see the field. Um, so I'm curious as to what your thoughts are on sort of her subbing pattern and, and what her thought was behind all of that. Well, my, my biggest issue with that is if you call players up for international friendlies, I, I totally understand, you know, World Cups, Olympics, not everybody's going to play. That's very, very rarely does that actually happen. But when you have an international friendly and you have the opportunity to test the waters of a lot of different of your, a lot of different players, you need to do that. And and if you don't do that, I think that that speaks very poorly about the decision-making of the person in charge. And I, I understand that sometimes uh, it, it, you know, you, you, the, the game changes and you can't put in the, that young, budding potential star because you want to leave your better players in. But at the same time, if you don't sub in your players that you bring with, what did you get? What did they get out of this experience? They traveled all the way to Europe. They trained, but they didn't play. If, if you want to put these younger or just in general players on the field to get more international experience, this is, that's how you do it. You can't, you can go through all the steps, but if you never get in the game, you're not actually learning anything. Like it's, it's one thing to, to go to the store and, you know, grab a bottle of soda and bring it all the way to the counter. But then if you just walk out and forget to, you know, and not actually buy it, like what, why did you go to the store? What was your, what was your reason for going there? You know, like it doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense, you know, like you want to experience the soda and then you don't get to take. (laughs) <laughs> right, exactly. It's like, all right, here's my here's my soda. This is great, but uh, I'm actually not going to buy it. I'm just going to leave it on the counter. I got the experience that I wanted, but I'm not actually going to fully enjoy the soda. So, it it I think that I think that's got to stress a lot of people out, and I think I would be frustrated if I was a player, especially if I made that trip and didn't appear in either of the games. You know, I, I don't have right. that I don't have that in front of me if that ended up happening or not, but I, I think that that would be incredibly frustrating and something that I might want to try to you know pull my coach aside from and say, hey, like. I, I totally respect your authority, but I'd love to just get your thoughts on why. Why didn't I play at all? You know, kind of a thing. So that uh, I feel like that can be very frustrating for some players and a, a morale killer as well, too, at times. Absolutely. I would love to just touch on how well I thought Abby Dahlkamper did yesterday, though. Yes. Um, she is one of the new players that's you know, that's coming in and, and 
getting minutes and getting seen. And I was really happy to see her in there. Uh, I thought she did fantastic yesterday, especially as, you know, as a, as a young player, someone who's just kind of coming into that system and to play against a good Norway team. I thought she was fantastic. Yeah, I mean, the fact that she got 90 minutes uh, in what had been a long time coming for her, I think, is a, a huge testament to her. So congratulations to her on that one. Uh, she's been a, a shining star for the Courage this season as well, too, uh, in the NWSL. So uh, very exciting uh, to see what Abby can potentially continue to do uh, moving forward for club and country as well, too. Do you think she's going to find a way to be a consistent fixture on that back line for the national team? I would love to see that happen. I'm not sure... Exactly. I, I'm not sure exactly what that looks like. Just because Jill likes to play a four back instead of a three back, I see her as more of a center back. And, you know, the partnership and camaraderie and chemistry that, that Ertz and Sauerbrunn have, I think will be very hard to break into. Um, so I think it'll be interesting to see going forward. I think she is a player with a ton of potential, and I would absolutely love to see her in the back line. I just don't know. Um, what that looks like. And I think we saw a little bit of that yesterday when, um, when Ellis put Ertz in out on the right hand side. So again, there was a little bit of experimentation there, which, which I like to see. That's what you want to see from an international friendly. So we'll, you know, I would like to keep an eye out on that to kind of see how the back line shapes up. But I think the three of those players in, the, in a back line would give us a really, really strong back line. Yeah. I, I'm looking at the starting 11 from yes, from the, from that game against Norway. I mean, Becky Sauerbrunn and Kelly O'Hara are your are literally your two veterans on this starting eleven. Because then it goes Sam Mewis, Abby Del Camper, Casey Short, Rose Lavelle, Crystal Dunn, Allie Long, Mal Pugh, and Kristen Press. I mean, if you want to talk about a changing of the guard, this is a huge indicator of the guard definitely being changed quickly. And I think that that might I think that that lineup at least surprised me when I saw it come out. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how other people reacted to it, or even yourself personally when you saw it pop up. But uh, I mean. You can definitely tell that Jill Alice is trying to get that youth movement, maybe maybe almost trying to force it. Yeah, I think you know I think you need to find a, a balance, right? Life's all about balance, and I think the more the more games that they can play, and I think what's great is that you know they have the um, the Tournament of Nations coming up in end of July and August. So again, I think that'll be another great chance to sort of get these young players in, but there still needs to be that veteran representation and leadership on the field. I completely agree. Uh, all right. Well, we are going to run to a, another break. Uh, when we come back on the other side, uh, Fox sports internationals, Mark Sherber is going to be here with us to help us recap the USA, Mexico international friendly or not even international friendly, rather the, uh, world cup qualifying the game. There's been too many international friendlies going on. I'm stuck on that, I guess, but, uh, we will talk about that when we come back. She's Rachel Wood. I'm Baxter Colburn. We'll be back with more on two up front right after this. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Two Up Front, presented by Three Lions Pub. I am Baxter Colburn. No Simon Provan this week, as we've been mentioning throughout the broadcast today. He is off for the week. Uh, he'll be back a little bit later on uh, next week, so make sure to tune back in. For those of you that are Simon Provan fans, you'll be able to catch him uh, on the program next week, of course. Uh, and if you've been listening to the program today, of course, as well, you also know that uh, we do have a guest co-host today, Rachel Wood. She is also actually stepping out for this interview, so she's not going to be able to be here either. Uh, so I've, al I've already gone through two co-hosts. We're not even halfway through the show. So I, I don't know exactly if it's me or maybe if I forgot to shower or what the issue is apparently. But uh, be that as it may, we are going to continue to press on uh, because we've got another great opportunity to get a great player interview on the program. We've had several players come on from the Chicago Red Stars uh, over the last couple of weeks. Uh, we've had the likes of uh, Steph McCaffrey and Casey Short, uh, Morgan Prophet, many others as well, too. Uh, but now we get to add to that arsenal of Chicago Red Stars players. Joining us now on the shopfutsal.com call-in line is a midfielder, number four. It's Alyssa Motts. Very good day to you, Alyssa. Welcome to Two Up Front. How are you today? Hi, I'm good. 
Well, I'm glad to have you on the program today, Alyssa. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I believe congratulations are in order. The Red Stars, just two points out of first place in the NWSL. It's got to be an exciting time there down in uh, the Windy City. How are, how are you feeling? How's the team feeling? Uh, feeling just two points out of first place right now in the standings. I think uh, overall we're all pretty happy with where we're at in the standings. Um, it's kind of exciting, too, for us because i um, always looking to be in that playoff position. So it's definitely exciting and a good spot to be in. Absolutely. Uh, two losses on the season so far, but aside from that, uh, eight games played, 16 total points. Things are certainly looking on the up and up so far. What, what would you say has been a, a key component to Chicago's success through the first uh, eight games of the season in your mind? Um, I think the key one is like our chemistry on and off the field. It's been great. Um, we've been able to actually work on things um, that we haven't been able to in previous years, like attacking wise and stuff. Um, and we've just really cued in on um, staying focused throughout the game on what we need to do defensively and then and staying organized. So I think that's been really helpful for us. And as a group, we're all on the same page um, on the field and off the field. So it's been just positive all around for us. And speaking to that as well, too, uh, you've been a part of this club, uh, at least from everything that I've been able to find, uh, since 2013. Is that correct? Yes. So you definitely have been a... I'm a true a, like veteran on the team now. You, are, <laughs> you absolutely are. Not even uh, not even 28 uh, years old yet, and you consider yourself a seasoned yeah. veteran. But uh, sometimes teams like you know need players like yourself, though, that have uh, been around, that have seen some things. And uh, consistency at this level, of course, is certainly key. Uh, you actually got to spend some time down in Australia as well, too. Got to play for the Perth Glory uh, and down in the W League. Uh, I'm curious to get your thoughts about that experience because everybody that we've talked to, at least, uh, has loved their time down in the W League. Uh, is that does that still ring true for yourself, also? Yes, um, I had a great experience um, in Australia. It was a great place for me in the off season to work on what I needed to work on individually, and then the perk of it was like the team was great, the atmosphere was awesome there, and I mean, it was obviously the weather was even another bonus. Um, on top of it, all with just being there and playing soccer and enjoying life, it was just an all-around um, great experience for me. Talking with Alyssa Motz here on the shopfutsal.com. Call in line on two up front. Uh, staying in the W League briefly, Alyssa, uh, we've heard from folks okay. that uh, the league is similar to the NWSL in the sense that you get a lot of the same players, obviously, from the NWSL that go and spend the quote-unquote winter months, summer months for Australia, down there in, uh, mm-hmm. down under, of course, do you feel that because a lot of these players see each other basically year-round, that makes them better players? Or do you get bored a little bit at times because you're, you're seeing some of the same ladies that you see week in and week out? Yeah, I think, um, well, I feel like last year was like the, there was a lot more of NWSL players there. So I think the higher the, and it was bringing up the level was higher there. So I think it was great for all of us to be there at a high level and be going against some players that you need to work on other things. And then you're coming back and um, you're not having to get back into the environment at NWSL and um, having to like keep up with the speed of play there. You know, it's like you're still um, working on that in W League but and bringing it back to NWSL as well. One of the things, too, uh, I mean, speaking about the growth of the NWSL, as you mentioned, the consistency has been a huge key of that as well, too. We've seen more teams get added to the league since the in the inception of it, and you, someone like yourself, as you mentioned, not that old, but also you've been around for, for a while, too, when it comes to mm-hmm. the, the NWSL. <laughs> uh, what, what would you have to rate, or if you had to give a grade to the, the state of NWSL right now, five years young, but also still crushing landmarks left and right for women's professional soccer. Are you are you satisfied with where the league is right now, or do you think it still has a lot of room to grow? Um, I'm, I mean, it's definitely satisfying. Each year it's growing and growing and getting better, so it's, I feel like it's going in the best, like the, uh, the route it needs to be going. Um, obviously, I think it's just going to get better and better each year. Um, the more players uh, that get into the league, and I feel like we're getting more – um, internationals coming back to the league because I played in the WPS and we, there were so many internationals and that brought the level even higher. And I feel like the level at NWSL is now, I feel like it's great um, 
definitely the top league that women can play in for sure. And I feel very satisfied of where the league is going at now for sure. And I can certainly agree with that as well, too, from someone that's covered the league the last couple of years. The the growth has certainly been uh, very exciting to see, and I can't even imagine being someone like yourself yeah. and the numerous other people that are in the nitty-gritty of it day in and day out. So I'm sure you've got to be, as you mentioned, uh, thrilled with the overall growth thus far. Uh, s- stepping away from the growth yeah. of that, um, I, I need to confirm something with you because uh, about a month or two ago, we had Steph McCaffrey on the program, one of your teammates down on the Chicago Red Stars, and ever since then, uh, she mentioned how Chicago has the world's greatest donuts, and I need to confirm that with <laughs> you because she is apparently just becoming the spokesperson for donuts in Chicago. I've been to Chicago. I was down there actually for Memorial Day. Uh, I, I had uh, one of Stan's donuts. I don't know if you've had Stan's donuts or not either, but I need you to confirm yeah. or deny how. Uh, what, what's the donut scene like in your opinion in Chicago? Um, I'm going to have to agree with Steph. Definitely the best donuts are in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so, what donut did you get, Dan? Uh, I got the bomb pop. Was that was that a good choice? Mm, I haven't got that one. Ooh, so I mean, it's it's very much that. I would go stereo- for the blueberry old fashioned. You try that one. Ooh, the blueberry old fashioned. Okay, I mean, I'm only in about an hour and a half away from Chicago. I'm up in Milwaukee, so I'm gonna have to. Uh, See about getting down to another Stan's Donut run here in the in the near future. So I'm uh, I'm gonna be yeah. excited for that. But uh, aside from that, <laughs> though, um, I'm I'm supposedly supposed to give you a little bit of grief because my co-host, as I mentioned before, you came on. Uh, Simon is actually a graduate of the University of Texas, and I'm sure if he was here, he'd be giving you a little bit of uh, stick because of you going to A and M, of course. But uh, you had a lot of success when you were down at Texas A&M. I, I wondered if you'd speak about that briefly, because uh, from everything that I've been able to see, you you know registered some hat tricks. You had five game-winning goals during your career as well, too. Seemed like you know your your soccer career really blossomed and kind of exploded when you were down at Texas A&M. Yeah, uh, A&M was awesome for me. It was a great fit. Um, definitely grew as a player for sure. Uh, and in College Station, um, it was overall like the best decision I think for me Um, and we will always be better than to you. (laughs) (laughs) Those that will not be named. (laughs) But yeah, uh, I definitely grew as a player. Um, I respected my coaches a lot. They definitely um, helped me throughout and always were willing to do the extra um, stuff before or after practice and even um get some film uh, done so they were helpful in that aspect of my career absolutely absolutely uh, we're talking with Alyssa Motz here on the shop com. call in line Alyssa uh, this weekend uh, the Red Stars they take on the Washington Spirit uh, 3.30 p.m. Eastern time on Lifetime that's going to be a big one especially playing in front of a national audience as well too uh, Washington of course uh, a little bit of a polar opposite from where the Red Stars are at this point in the season but uh, what has uh, Coach Rory Dames told you, ladies, this week in, pre- in preparation for uh, a very uh, shaky uh, Washington Spirit team right now? Um, I think, well, we haven't really talked about what we're going to focus on um, for the game coming up, but I think we are just going to build off from where we uh, left off at Seattle and build on more of attacking and staying organized throughout the game. Um and just more worried about ourselves than anything. And absolutely about that. I mean, if you uh, if Boston does their job this weekend uh, and you ladies do your job, you could find yourself sitting in first place come Sunday morning. So uh, a celebration at Stan's Donuts might be in order for all of us uh, if that ends up happening, Alyssa. So we'll have to uh, have to see if that ends up. We'll have to see if that comes to fruition or not. But uh, I, I want to say thank you for taking the time today to, to join me here on Two Up Front. I uh, hope to have you back on again at some point. And, uh, and if we're ever down in the uh, Chicago area doing a broadcast, we may have to meet up at Stan's Donuts and do a live broadcast and a taste test on the air as well, too, if it works yeah. out. That would be great. Perfect. Well, Alyssa, it was a pleasure, uh, and we wish you the very best of luck this weekend, and uh, we look forward to having you back on the program soon if it works out. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, there goes Alyssa Motz on the shopfutsal.com. Call in line. We're going to run to a break. we got much more in store for you. Make sure to keep it here. It's Two Up Front presented by Three Lines Pub. Back right after this.
Welcome back to Two Up Front, presented by Three Lions Pub. I am Baxter Colburn. No Simon Provan this week. He is off. Uh, he'll be back next week, uh, as I mentioned earlier in the program. Of course, if you want to interact with us, you can find us on social media. I'm at Baxter Colburn. You can find Simon at, at Simon Provan. At Two Up Front Soccer is the show Twitter handle if you want to say hi or give us any thoughts or suggestions or other possible guests you'd like us to have on the program at some point as well, too. We love uh, the Twitter community, of course, and uh, give us a like on Facebook as well, too. If you're more of a Facebooker than a tweeter, uh, just look for Two Up Front on Facebook. Uh, I am Baxter Colburn. Uh, hanging out today with me is Rachel Wood. So a uh, very good hey, hi back to you again, Rachel. Uh, if you survived so far through the first couple of segments of the show, you feeling you feeling fairly confident about your broadcasting career so far? So far, so good. Yeah, I um, yeah, I feel really confident about it. <laughs> oh, good, good. And for those that uh, yeah. for those that are just joining us, uh, Rachel Woods' guest segment is uh, brought to you by Julie Foudy today. Apparently, so a very special thanks to Julie Foudy for being the official sponsor and uh, promoter of Rachel Wood. Uh, whether she thanks, knows Jules, it or you're not, my girl. <laughs> whether or not she knows it or not, yeah, Julie Foudy is uh, the reason Rachel Wood is doing anything with her life. So uh, we give a, a shout out to to, Jul- to Jules. Apparently, is what we're calling her because we're we're on that sort of level. But, or Loudy uh, Foudy, you know. Loudy Foudy, Jules, Loudy Foudy. One. Can we can we get her on the program, Rach? Can you can you talk to her people? I don't know. Let me see. Let me see what I can do. Yeah, talk to your people, and uh, you let us know, and we can see. If we I can will have it. my people call her people, and then maybe we'll do. And lunch. then we'll see if yeah. Perfect. Exactly. I like it. I like it. Well, uh, we talked about this uh, earlier in the program. Uh, USA took on Mexico uh, Sunday evening down at the Azteca, a one-one draw, and one of the gentlemen. Uh, that had an opportunity to talk about it uh, and in general uh, does a great job talking about soccer. Uh, he's a commentator over at Fox Sports. We've had Rob Stone and others on from Fox Sports before. Uh, it's Mark Serber, and he joins us now uh, on the program on the shopfutsal.com call-in line. A very good day to you, Mark. Welcome to Two Up Front, sir. How are you today? I'm doing well, thanks. Well, it's good to have you on the program. So a 1-1 draw last night, Mark. Uh, Michael Bradley setting the Twitterverse and social media ablaze with his wonderful chip goal uh, early on. Uh, I actually turned the TV on uh, 10 minutes in because I got the start time a little mixed up and was shocked that it was 1-0. And then, uh, of course, what ended up happening after that with Mexico scoring. But uh, that, that goal so early on, that confidence booster for the United States and for Michael Bradley especially, who I feel like has been kind of kind of quiet recently. But how did you react when that goal from Bradley went in? I was absolutely stunned. First of all, that's just a world-class finish. I mean, the ability to, to – first of all, not only when you make an interception, but to know what you're going to do with the ball – in the process of making the interception afterward. And he stepped in. He saw that play developing. He actually talked about the fact that they had studied film, and they talked about the fact that Chicharito Hernandez at times was going to drop back into the midfield to get the ball, and that meant a midfielder would be running through, and that's where Chicharito Hernandez's next lip was going to be. So Bradley read that play from film that they had watched before the game, steps in, wins that ball, and still has the ability to look up, notice that the keeper's off his line, and try perhaps one of the hardest shots in soccer. So just all around, from before he even wins it, to seeing that Ochoa is just over 11 yards out of the goal and still being able to chip him from over 40 yards is world class. What was that they kept saying? Wasn't it like 11.53 yards or something like that? They kept showing the the infographic, I feel like, numerous times throughout the broadcast there. But uh, that that's one of those plays that I feel like just absolutely electrifies a game and sends a message, especially so early in a game as well, too. So uh, I think that that was a huge confidence booster for the United States. But Mexico, of course, had an answer uh, just a, a couple of minutes later as well, too. Uh, what did you make of that wonderful individual effort there from uh, from Mexico and their goal scorer? Um, well, as a U.S. fan, I was just absolutely demoralized because, first of all, Bobby Wood, 20 seconds earlier, if he not only not scores, but if he just gets a shot off, if he doesn't whiff that ball, then maybe it bounces off a player and goes out for a corner and we're not getting caught on a counterattack. And so that was the first thing. And then second of all, the balance and cover when we were getting back was just terrible. First of all, Kellen Acosta has to foul in the midfield. He's a young player, and I love the fact that he's trying to be pure in the game. But you got to take that yellow card there. It's a Mexico team that's going to counter, that's going to score on the few chances that they're going to create, if you can even limit them to a few chances. And the other thing, too, is 
DeMarcus Beasley gets beat there, but Jeff Cameron and the other center backs aren't sliding over. So it was really frustrating because I felt that it was a goal that could have very well been prevented. And we did so well to limit their chances and so well to to cut them down to, to crosses from the wings, which we were able to repel. But that was the one time we were really opened up, and, and there were so many instances where we could have taken care of that play. Mark, I have a quick question for you, too, on that goal. Um, what did you think about the goalkeeping? Because when I saw the starting 11 announced, I was shocked that Tim Howard wasn't in it. And I do know that he, he's still recovering from injury. Um, but again, you know, watching Guzan in the premiership this year, um, I think he's been a little bit shaky. Do you have any, do you have any insight on that? <laughs> I did think his positioning was off a bit. I think he should have been shaded a bit more towards that near post where he was beaten. And uh, I understand him coming out to cut on the angle, but he's he's kind of a bit far out. I was kind of surprised to see uh, Guzin in the lineup too. I think you're absolutely right about his play for Middlesbrough. But at the same time, I have to understand that with Middlesbrough, he was probably facing about 55 shots a game. Um, but I do think that on that particular goal, he, uh, he could have possibly done better. I'm not good enough of an expert of, um, a goal, a goalkeeping position to say that, but I do think that if him and his goalkeeping coaches are definitely going to go back and look at that tape and look at his positioning and his starting point on that shot, because it did seem to find that near post a bit too easily. I I think too, from someone that played the forward position for, for several years, Mark, uh, I, as a forward in that position, if I were to walk myself through that, you really have two shots. You either cut it really, really hard to that near post, as we saw, or you really try to bend it to the far post. And a lot of people, I feel like, would argue that that near post shot is the harder of the two shots, I I feel like, especially when you're running across the face of goal to then suddenly twerk your body, basically, to like cut it back right across the face of goal. I feel like it has to be a much more difficult goal and usually a more well-trafficked area to try to, to try to sneak a ball through. So I think I'll, I, I, regardless of the team you support, I feel like your hat still has to come off to the goal or in that, you know, in that instance because of you know, what he had to do to put that ball uh, in that near post for Mexico. Oh, absolutely. Um, not to make comparisons, but if if you want to look at a player that perhaps is better known around the world, and uh, Aaron Robin is so good at cutting inside for Bayern Munich and Holland, and then turning and finding that near corner. We saw him do it in that destruction of Arsenal in the Champions League, and it's it's a tough skill to do. And some of the best players in the world in the modern day have been players that have made their living starting in those wide positions and cutting in and usually finishing like that. And you talk about the degree of difficulty it, it takes to finish at the near post. Well, I mean, you, you have to learn to do it to be one of the top players in the world because like we saw a little bit with Guzan, most of the goalkeepers are expecting that shot to the far post and they're going to shade over a bit. Yeah, that's definitely one of those situations where you see how many messy goals or in general many goals like that where they that that curler to the far post that just sneaks in that top corner and you know makes you know sports centers top ten plays or a highlight video on YouTube somewhere as well too for top you know upper ninety goals or something like that. So it was good to see a, a little bit of a difference and a little bit of a flair in that regards as well too. Uh, I, I want to ask you though in general um, your thoughts about just some of the lineup choices as a whole. We saw Paul Ariola on the field last night. Josie didn't start last night. Clint Dempsey uh, was was kind of non-existent. I don't, if I, I could be wrong, I don't think he played at all last night. Am I, I did I see that wrong, or I was I was watching the game? No, Dempsey I, was on the bench the entire game. Yeah, yeah. So I, you know, things like that. I feel like you. I feel like the fact that Arena went to his bench with Josie in the late seventies. I felt was a little surprising to me personally, but what did you make of the lineup that got put out there? Was this a, let's throw some of the younger guys into the fire and see what happens? Is this the, this is just who Bruce Arena thought was going to match up the best. How did you interpret the starting 11 last night? Well, I mean, it's kind of easy to talk about it now in hindsight. Um, But I think, you know, my first thought was looking at the, at the lineup was he is bringing in every player that either plays or has played in Liga MX yep, and who's played multiple times at the Azteca, not just with the national team, but with their club team, who knows the league, who knows the players, who knows the tendencies. So I thought, you know, that was a very interesting move to start with. Um, the second thing with, you know, the five, three, two is obviously you have the wingbacks who are getting forward. And I thought that was a great move um, considering that most teams want to sit back and he's telling his wingbacks to get high into pressure. And I thought that really threw Mexico off in the beginning. 
And the other thing it does is when you have good center backs, it not only brings that stability to your defense, but the the ability to to play the ball out. And it also allows your midfield three in front of them to have at least one player from that midfield step up into that forward line and help with the pressure whenever need be. And that's exactly what happened on the Bradley goal. So uh, if they're not, if they didn't execute the way that they did, we might be having a very different conversation, but it was pretty brilliant um, looking at it. I wouldn't say it was a tactical masterclass, but I would say it was very well thought out and very smart. And the one thing arena said was the beginning of the camp when they all met for, for these two games uh, about a week and a half ago, was that, hey, we're going to make in between seven to nine changes in between the two games. And they made seven. And this is exactly how we're going to play. And we're going to spend the next uh, week and a half preparing to play like this. And they did just that. And what was really impressive, one thing Paul Ariola noted after the game, is that even though the players were young, it showed a lot of mental strength and maturity from the youngest guy all the way through to the most experienced guy that they were able to stick with that plan for almost 90 minutes. Mark, if you had to grade the U.S. on their past two games in these performances, what grade would you give them? I'm always harsh on the U.S., so I would say a B plus. <laughs> that's not I'm a bad thing them, to be harsh, that's for sure. Yeah. I'm going to give them the plus because they got a point in the Azteca, which yep. is very hard for any team, no matter what you do, or no matter who you are. But at the same time... I would like to see them not the teams that they're supposed to beat. I don't want to see them just beat them and say, oh, well, we'll take it. Because I wasn't that impressed with the way we played against Trinidad and Tobago. And the one thing I'd want to see more against Mexico is that ability to just hold the ball. I think the best 10 minutes in the second half were in between about the 65th and the 75th minute when we were able to hold the ball and possess it. And sometimes you're not always going to go forward and you're not going to create chances, which we actually ended up doing. But in a place like the Azteca, if you can just hold that ball and possess it a little bit, you get your breath back. You put the other team on the back foot a little bit. You make them chase. And then you're able to go ahead and do what you need to do, which is play a game where you're not going to have possession for a long time. And then we bring in Josie Altidore, for those final moments to hold the ball. And he doesn't do that at all. And that's exactly why he's being bought on. So that's where they lose their A range. But once again, I think I'm being a bit harsh because to get a point at the Azteca, only the third time that they've done that in World Cup qualifying is is something that really needs to be applauded. Talking with Mark Serber here on Two Up Front on the shopfutsal.com call in line. Uh, Mark, last thing for me, speaking of harsh grades and harsh comments, uh, I, w- I just want to go on the record to say that there is absolutely nobody on this team that is remotely close to the same amount of talent level as Christian Pulisic because he looks lost on that field, and I saw it numerous times last night. And I don't mean lost in a bad way. I mean lost in a in a in the fact that he has so much talent that he doesn't have teammates that know what to do when he has the ball. There was so many times last night that I felt like when he had the ball running down the sideline or running, cutting into the middle of the field, and it was him versus four different Mexico defenders because his teammates didn't have the tactical awareness or the speed or just the general know-a-thought and wherewithal to get up the field and support him. And I think that's a testament to his talent, first of all, because obviously he scored two goals against Trinidad, and that's phenomenal. So congratulations to him. But I feel like there is such a drop-off in talent from what Pulisic is doing continuously and what the rest of the team is doing around him. And I think that might end up unfortunately hurting the U.S. instead of helping them going forward. I don't know where you stand on that, but I saw that a lot last night, and I was rather saddened by it. I mean, it, it's the Azteca, right? It's uh, smoggy. It's above a mile altitude. You are playing in a certain way where you're very conservative. We saw what happened when they got caught on the counter. I think if they are playing anywhere else, the way that Pulisic was getting forward, if other players are joining him, like you said that they weren't, he maybe has one or two assists in that game. So I think you're absolutely right. But I also think a lot of the players in just this particular this particular sense were, were scared to jump into the attack and then get caught on a counter. And so I think that with some of the runs Pulisic made yesterday, if, if he's making that in, say, Columbus – or somewhere else, and the U.S. isn't playing Mexico, then I think you're seeing his teammates get on the ends of things. However, 
in terms of him being an 18 year old and where he is and the confidence that he has and the way that he's directing the more senior players, you're absolutely right that he's head and shoulders above the rest in terms of his skill level and his vision and his grit right now. Um, but I think, you know, one thing we forget, especially with young American talent is that a soccer career, when it starts at the age of 16, as it does in so many other countries and is beginning to now for a lot of players that it's a marathon and not a sprint. And in this game, like in life, you are judged on what you do in the present and judged not what you did five years ago. So for him, I think we need to be really excited about him. And he definitely is head and shoulders above where almost any other player was when they were 18 years old, but he's going to be judged on what he does year by year. So I'm a, a bit, a bit hesitant to go ahead and say that, you know, he's already the best player ever. He's already one of the most successful in Europe in terms of what he's achieved, but still a long way to go. And, and, and one of the biggest things is how do you bring in the rest of your teammates? So we'll see how he does with that as well going forward. I would agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Rachel, I don't know if you had any other side comments with the whole Pulisic thing or not, but yeah, the, one of the thing I just wanted to top in here in case Rachel does have a comment is I noticed that he wasn't falling victim to the diving that was going on as well, too. There was a moment, I don't remember when it was, and you might remember this too, he received the ball on the left side of the field when they were going right to left, and he kept cutting into the middle of the field. I think he escaped three or four tackles that virtually any other player would have gone down for. And you saw him ride the tackle, kind of lose his balance, get up, continue to keep pressing and pressing and pressing, and stay down his feet and put together a run, which basically should have ended three or four tackles earlier. But he had the, the, the knowledge and the balance and the talent to continue to just keep moving forward and not falling victim to the, oh, well, I, I've been touched by a player, so I'm going to fall to the ground now and just earn a free kick instead of trying to make something out of nothing. So I, I wanted to commend him on that last night as well, too. But uh, Rachel, did you have any other thoughts about Pulisic's performance or his general persona at this moment in time? I mean, you know me, I always have a comment. Um, but what is so fun for me to sort of watch him, and I, I, I love the fact that he's only 18 and there's so much potential and there's so much upside. But watching him, especially listening to you talk about how he's riding the tackles, you know, those are those are things that we see from the big-time players in Europe. You know, you talk about Messi's ability to ride a challenge. Um, you know, Ed, Eden Hazard, Eden Hazard, sorry, um, from Chelsea, you know, these guys, they're so quick and so explosive and their sort of knowledge and vision of the game is what makes them so fun to watch. And I see that so much in him. And I think with him playing over in Europe, that continues to help build his game and, and really put him at that level of sophistication that's just above the other players on the U.S. And, and what's so exciting for me to see, because I'm such a big fan of, you know, of world football, is that we're starting to develop players that have that sense of, of sophistication in America. And I think that this is a really cool starting point for the men's side to really sort of catch up with the rest of the world. And I just, you know, I can't wait to see how the team continues to develop, but especially – the younger players that, you know, the, the development academies are starting to, you know, to produce is, is really exciting. Really exciting. Absolutely. I would agree with you on that one for sure. So, all right, we are going to run it to a break, but uh, we want to thank uh, Fox Sports' is Mark Sherber for stopping by the program today. Uh, Mark, always a pleasure, sir. If people want to find you on social media, uh, where can they do so? At Soccer Serber. Perfect. Thanks so much, Mark. We'll talk to you soon, sir. Thank you. Bye, thank Mark. You. All right, when we come back, uh, we are going to continue to move along with the program. we got much more in store, so make sure you stay tuned. It is Two Up Front, presented by Three Lines Pub. Back after this.
Back inside the studio, two up front, closing things out. I am Baxter Colburn. No Simon Provan today. He is off for the week. He'll be back next week uh, unless he gets stuck out in the wilderness or wherever the heck he is right now. But uh, he and his family are out, uh, I believe, on the Laura Ingalls Wilder Trail or something of that nature. That's what he mentioned to me. So uh, I know his daughters are big fans of Laura and her work. Uh, so I'm assuming that uh, they are out doing something like that. So should be fun. Uh, a quick reminder, of course, uh, we are on the Twitterverse at Two Upfront Soccer. It's the number two, not T W O or T O or T O O or O O O O O, depending on how much you want to emphasize that. Uh, so the number two, Two Upfront Soccer. Uh, I am at Baxter Colburn at Simon Provan. Numerous ways, numerous places. Find us, love us, don't list us. We miss you. We love you all. Thank you. I don't know the things I can throw in there, honestly, but. Uh, I wanted to make one other comment. Earlier in the program, we had talked about uh, Jurgen Klinsmann's... I don't know, not, not Jurgen Klinsmann, Bruce Arena. I don't even know who's coaching the national team anymore. I, I know soccer, I promise. Uh, but Bruce Arena, uh, I feel like after the performances from the United States recently, he needs to now have a conversation with several of his young players and say, listen, Christian Pulisic is taking over Europe and he's taking over this national team. If I'm Bruce Arena, I'm having conversations with Kellen Acosta and several of my other younger players and say, get your butts to Europe now, because if you want to have a strong, steady core moving forward, you need, need, need to get that high-level experience. And I love Major League Soccer. I love what it has to offer. But you're not going to win a World Cup with Major League Soccer players on your roster. Not not a not a vast majority of the roster at least and that's what we're kind of seeing from some of the most recent rosters and i think mls has done a phenomenal job growing but at the end of the day do you need the six of the world to carry your team to world cup victory or in general just have success at a high international level so kellen acosta paul Ariola, some of those other younger talented players I would start talking to your agents and I would start trying to request a couple of uh, interviews with clubs in England and France and Germany. Uh, I would try to start seeing if you can maybe file some change of address form sooner rather than later. So anyway, leave that for what it is. If you have a comment about that, love to hear it. Uh, at Baxter Colburn on Twitter. Tell me how wrong I am. Tell me how right I am. Uh, preferably the latter. That'd be amazing. But totally up to you, of course. Numerous ways to tell me how smart or foolish you think I actually am. I want to bring my co-host back in, co-host Rachel back Wood. In. She's here, guest Wood. co-hosting, yes. brought to you by the wonderful yes. Foudy Laudy, Julie Laudy. Moody. She's here, Julie <laughs> Foudy, uh, Rachel Wood. You got to flip that one. Uh, well. how, how young are you again? Uh, yes. <laughs> I mean, no, I said, how young are you? I'm the Laudy Foudy was the... Oh, it's a little baby. Well, you're not even that much older than me. <laughs> no, I know. I know. But uh, no, the 99ers in the Loudy Foudy era. Loudy Come Foudy. On, Baxter. Loudy Foudy. Judy I'll Moody. send you a photo later. I, she signed a she signed a poster that I had. Aw. Uh, Are you fangirling? Loudy Foudy, you rock. I was. I was fangirling when I was nine. Um, and it was incredible to meet her this past week. So and now she's my sponsor. So there you there yeah. you have it. Rachel Wood, no matter where she goes, her appearances are all sponsored and funded solely by Laudy <laughs> Foudy. Julie Foudy. Oh, uh, if she ever hears this, she's gonna think I'm so creepy. She is. She's gonna be like, wait a minute. I did not sign she's gonna up. Be like, for wait. This. I'm sure Simon's probably <laughs> gonna like, listen what? back to the show as well too and be like, I leave for one week and suddenly Julie Foudy's sponsoring our guests. So like, well, yeah, you're welcome. I've been, I know, right? Been doing a lot of work. We're trying to <laughs> trying to bring people in, I guess. So uh, all right. Well, it is uh, our last segment of the show, uh, which, as many folks know, is our I Believe segment. I believe so, Baxter, what do you believe? I believe, I believe a lot of things, Rachel. I believe, I believe a lot of things. Um, I believe that, as I kind of alluded to earlier, I believe that the U.S. will not win a World Cup until a vast majority of their core roster is playing at the highest possible level in Europe. That's what I believe. I would agree with that. I actually, I believe that as well. Um, Get your own, I believe. Get your own, I believe. <laughs> I just can't retweet yours. Yeah, no, it's not how it works. <laughs> not how it works. Oh, bummer. Um, well, I will end the program on a more playful note. Oh, fun. In which case, I believe that Mark Sherber's favorite flavor of <laughs> sherbet ice cream is, in fact, rainbow sherbet. Yes. Sherbert. I love it. Yes. Yeah. I love Mark Sherbert. So we will confirm. We will confirm with Mark. We will yes. confirm with Mark just to see how right I am, um, and we will let you all know. That's amazing. I'm sure you can find it on Twitter somewhere. We'll we'll find a way to to ask him, and he, I'm sure he will respond with bated breath in that regards. But uh, 
Yes, a very special thanks to uh, Fox Sports' uh, Mark Serber of the Sherber and Sherber and Sherber uh, for joining us there. Uh, his rainbow sherbet, I'm sure, is yummy and phenomenal. So thanks to him for stopping by the program today. Special thanks to my wonderful fill-in co-host today, Rachel Wood. Always a pleasure, Rachel. We loved having you on the program. Uh, two Up Front's BFF and now official co-host sponsored by Julie Foudy. Sponsored by Julie Foudy. Thank you guys so much for having me on the show. It was a blast, and I'm always happy to do it. Like I Absolutely. said, I love to up front, and you guys are my best friends. So, oh, best friends. Love it. Hey, best friends. Happy to help out whenever I can. So, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, if they want to find you on the Twitterverse or social media when you check it every three or four weeks, um, where can they find you, Rachel? <laughs> they can find me at rmwood24. Perfect. rmwood24. You can find two up front at two up front soccer at Simon Provan at Baxter Colburn. Go check out our website, number two, two up front soccer.com. Give us a like on Facebook. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell your pets, tell everybody. Two up front. We're taking over the soccer world. One scoop of sherbet at a time. <laughs> That's going to be a great business venture for him. I'm telling you, like he, he needs to put out his own line of rainbow sherbet. He's missing out. We need to give we need to get Mark yep. on the phone right now, and we got to tell him that he's missing out. So, well, uh, thank you to Rachel well, uh, Wood. Thank you to all of you that stopped by today as well too. We will talk to you next time with our manager being the one above. We are two up front.